All right, it's about 11.10, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so today we are fortunate to have a guest lecturer, Mark Messia, who leads the Ranger Training Program here at NAU. And so I'm gonna turn over to him for a uh, for lecture, and he's happy to take questions um, as well. So if you wanna raise your hand, either in person or online, or use the chat, you're welcome to. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to okay. you. Well, thanks. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind, I'm far enough away, so I'm going to get rid of this thing. Um, yeah, so I'm Mark Messia, the director of the Park Ranger Training Program that meets right next door. And what we do is essentially a law enforcement academy for those that aspire to work for the National Park Service or other land management agencies. How I got here, I have three degrees from this place. Um, started out in uh, what's now criminal justice, but police science, uh, because that's one of the functions that we perform in the National Park Service. Um, so I got that and I thought, you know, I left here, I would never come back to an educational institution ever in my life and um, found a need to, for some further development. So I got a, picked up a couple of master's degrees and then eventually a doctorate in education here. So it sounded like you're in education just based on the oh, side conversations. Yeah. Okay. So we do it all in the national park system. Um, so in between all that education, I worked for the National Park Service for 27 years, uh, primarily in the emergency services, law enforcement um, functions, and that's what gets all the press and you see on TV and everything. But really there's much more to managing the system than that. And I'll touch on some of that this morning. Um, and I think we have officially 35 different disciplines identified within the agency so if you have any kind of interest whatsoever in working, I think there's a place in the National Park Service for you. Um, you know, we got people who have degrees in communication. You think of some place like Grand Canyon, there are 3,000 people that live there to support that operation. And so they have, we have sewage treatment plants. I know that's not really, you know, too sexy or anything, but that has to happen, concession operations there's a ton of people it takes to make those places work. So um, accountants, geez, um, and then the technical side of resource management, the cultural natural resources. Um, I think a lot of people think that's all we do, but there's there's much more to it than that. So Dr. Barnes asked me to, to kind of provide you a, a day in the life of a ranger and, and some foundation of, of my old agency. I still feel that I'm connected to it. Um, a day in the life, I don't know, it's <laughs> changed so much. And that's what I loved about the job. And like I said, there's so many different things that we do. And in my world, I could be a cop one minute and a structural firefighter the next, and then get detailed to someplace else to work. Um, we have units of the system from the Virgin Islands to Guam, to Saipan, 200 or I'm sorry 423 different units of the system and they sent me all over the place and it was great so um, that's part of what I enjoyed and, and certainly if you have questions or just um, if you're out there in TV land just speak up and um, we'll address your questions as, as we move through here um, and I, I taught a comparable class just yesterday but early 1900s the country started to realize hey, all of this stuff is going to disappear unless we do something about it. U.S. Forest Service came about in 1905. You can see there the National Park Service in 1916. My daughter was born on August 25th, so that's how dedicated I am to the National Park System. Um, and the, all the different land management agencies, we all do pretty much the same thing, different slants on the, the mission. For the National Park Service, it's preserving things that the way they were before the Europeans came over, and at the same time providing for recreation in those places. Does anybody feel a conflict with that? And if I could just keep the darn people out of the place, the preservation part would be easy. So, and, and why would we preserve it without allowing for the enjoyment of those resources? So some people would suggest, well, those two things are in conflict, but, but really they're not. The guy in the picture here is a guy named Horace Albright, and many units of the National Park System and actually the agency itself came about because of individual commitment. And I don't know if you guys have, have talked about Albright just a little bit, 
this guy ran around knocking on back doors and sneaking into places and got the legislation through that created the agency. And it's not unlike someplace like Petrified Forest where the locals just got ticked off with people coming in literally blowing up the petrified wood to get the crystals inside. Um, and it's not any different than today with local communities thinking, well, you know, we're a national monument and we think we need to be a national park. There's a technical difference there, but the perception is a park has more value. The difference really is national monuments are established by presidential proclamation, parks by Congress, and typically monuments and historically were more of a single resource. So Petrified Forest was a national monument up until 1962. Well, that's all we knew about in 1906 when it was founded was petrified wood. Well, the resource knowledge has expanded in those well, since then. And then the land expanded and it became a park um, many years later. So the difference is how the unit comes into the system. If it's Congress or the president that um, creates those things, but the protection is the same, the laws are the same. Um, and, and frankly, lately it's been kind of a political deal, um, but that's just the way those things go. But but again, it's individual commitments like Albright there and, and local communities that, that really care for these places. <clears throat> so, sorry that got scrambled up a little bit. This looks different when I put this together, but a typical national park, it's kind of run like a city. There's a park superintendent who's in charge, kind of like the mayor. Um, on the sidelines there, we have safety and public affairs. So those positions really don't have line authority, but they have authority over the whole operation. If we can't do it safely and we can't go home tonight, then it's dumb. So that's the importance of, of operating safely. Public affairs, again, works throughout the, the food chain there. Um, and it depends on the size of the park. Some of those functions may be what's known as a collateral duty. So like I was a public affairs officer, but I actually had a primary responsibility elsewhere at one point in my career. And then the five major divisions, I don't like the word division because that connotates, well, we're separate and we don't work together, but we really do. Administration, so all the accounting, the financial management, hiring, firing, all of that. Uh, interpretation and education, so those are the folks that run the visitor centers, do the typical ranger programs that you might think of, um, outreach to schools, maintenance. Like I said, we got sewage treatment plants, we got freshwater systems, we have historic buildings, and all those have to be maintained within certain standards. The resource managers are the, what I call hard science folks, but um, managing the, the natural resources and the cultural resources that we protect. And then visitor and resource protection is where I lived, and it was a blast. Um, but but we really got to do it all, and that's what kept me going for the 27 years that, that I worked for him, and still kind of in, so, in association with the agency 10 years later. So this is what everybody thinks we do, and there's, there's a lot of misconceptions, and people that are interested in my program or working for the Park Service, it's like, yeah, you guys are out there, you know, rescuing people, and it looks like it's, you know, cops or you know, live PD or whatever TV show that you want to look at. We, we do a lot of telling people where the bathrooms are. Um, <laughs> if you can't figure that out, then, you know, there's kind of a problem there. But, um, and, and these are all pictures from Grand Canyon and, and Rangers in action. But, but that's the conception is you think about the national park system and it's the Grand Canyons, the Yosemites, those big tracts of land primarily in the West and all of us doing this kind of hero stuff. Um, that's actually not a lot of what we do. Certain parks have a high call volume in that. So Grand Canyon, obviously, despite our best efforts, people still get sideways um, and need to be rescued. And when you think about the system, again, it's, it's these big expanses of land that we generally think about the national park system, but in reality, more places like this. Um, anybody know the where the picture from the upper left is? 
Um, we'll we'll silence the world here. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, somebody's got their mic on, so I'm just gonna shut that off. Okay. Thank you. No worries. It was just feed in back. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. I'm used to working in chaos. But anyway, so upper left hand. Anybody have any guesses where that might be? Anybody ever hear the War of 1812? Anybody ever hear of, oh, I don't know, the Star Spangled Banner? Anybody ever hear of Fort McHenry? Um, so that's Fort McHenry in, in Baltimore, and interestingly, I got a chance to visit there kind of as a part of my job. And I, I got home, and my new passport was in the mail, and I opened it up, and what was in the inside of the passport? Picture of Fort McHenry. Um, upper right, you know, any guesses? It's not too far from here. A place called Hubble Trading Post up on the Navajo Reservation. <clears throat> and you might look at that and go, well, you know, Navajo rugs I know are really expensive. And, and those are kind of some of the resources that we protect. But that particular rug is actually a fake. It's a replica to create the historic scene in that particular building. But that replica is worth $50,000. I don't know what the original would be worth, but so we want to provide for the enjoyment of and show people what places looked like at the time that they were used, but we can't put down a priceless Navajo rug. So this one was created for us. Um, lower left, same neighborhood, Canyon de Chez, up in Chinle, Arizona. Interestingly owned by, or the property is belongs to the Navajo tribe, but we manage that as a unit of the national park system. And then finally, the we call them the cannonball parks, but um, that could be any place that had a Civil War action. Um, that one's probably Gettysburg, but those are more of what we protect. And the greatest number of units in the system are historic sites like that, not the Grand Canyons. And, and for my job at working in, in law enforcement, um, those factors made it difficult. And, and you go back and look at that cannon, is that a real cannon or is that a replica? You kind of have to know that <laughs> if you're working out there, the deal with the rug. Um, and so the difference between park rangers and say the Phoenix Police Department would be that specialized resource protection knowledge and the knowledge of the resources, not just the cultural things we just looked at, but but nature. Um, you go stepping off the trail at Death Valley, you crush through the cryptogramic soils, you know, and then you destroy the place. And so, as a ranger, if I didn't know that, then I probably wouldn't be as active in enforcing dumb things like staying on the trail, but being able to put that into context for visitors and explain that and tell them why. Because, you know, mom tells you to do something and what's your first response? And response, why do I have to do that? Well, because I said so. Well, that doesn't really work in law enforcement in the world, but we are out there trying to provide for the enjoyment of these resources and understanding. And it's, oh, by the way, this is what happens when you go off the trail. So knowledge of, of the resources and the particular laws. I just spent eight hours yesterday teaching about the resource laws that we enforce. Um, different patrol methods, LAPD or, or Phoenix, you know, they're driving around in their patrol cars, maybe horseback. I got to patrol on horseback, in boats, in military aircraft, patrol cars. Uh, it was cool. Think of, a, I worked in a place like, well, I worked in Death Valley my district or my half of the park was 1.5 million acres. Well, how do you get to all that with a short staff? Well, got a big silver thing with wings on it and we go fly or we tap into military assets and, and we got to do a bunch of cool stuff. So um, it's certainly a unique experience. Not many people can do that. And what it all boils down to are really these three things, um, protecting the people from the parks because 
I grew up in Southern California. What the heck do I know about what's going to hurt me in the park? Like zero. And Santa Ana is, you know, Southern California beach and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, so educating people and, and our philosophy is using the lowest effective means of enforcement. So if I can talk, well, even back up from that, if I can design something that will prevent you from screwing up, then it's, it's solved. Anybody ever fly through Sky Harbor Airport? Do you need a guided person to tell you where to go or is the design set up so that you can just figure out how to get to your next airplane? So through park design, and there's we could probably spend three days talking about that, but how do we direct people to do the right thing just by the way the place is put together. And if that doesn't work, then folks like me would come in. So protecting the people from the parks, the parks from the people, you know, people do crazy stuff and that's why I was employed for 27 years. Um, you know, it's just, um, and a lot of it is unintentional, feeding the squirrels. If you go to South Rim, you know, there's signs and, um, it's harmful to wildlife. So educating folks and trying to pre-educate them, that's not really a word, but trying to educate them prior to their visit is, is super helpful. Anybody see the news on the bison not caring for our visitors that pester them at Yellowstone? Um, yeah, they take care of business themselves sometimes. But so, you know, trying to keep people safe out there and then um, our larger parks, this is a big issue, but people from people, and that's actually the the biggest volume of work that we have at a place like Grand Canyon or, or Yosemite. Not to say that those are nasty places, it's just you get 3,000 people together in a small place without a lot of entertainment, and, and but they have the same stuff going on up there that they do in Phoenix. It's just smaller volume and we get to work in a really cool place. So, And then I would also say the parks from the parks I visited um, Rocky Mountain not too long ago, and there was this, and I'd been there several times, and there's this big swath of trees cut down alongside the road, and I'm going, what is going on? I'm ticked off. Well, there's bark beetle issues, there's fire, there's other reasons that they made this big old clear cut right through the middle of the park, which, well, and then it all burned up last summer, so I guess it kind of self-regulated. But so parks from the parks and competing resource needs. So how do you keep it natural? And I look at some place like Grand Canyon, and when I worked there in the early 80s, there were like 12 elk out there, and now the place is overrun with elk. So how do you manage that? So there's it's it, if it was easy, everybody would do it, but there's it can be a complex job. And there's different agencies that, that protect public lands. And like I said, just slightly different missions. We have now 423 units in the National Park System, probably three quarters or more of those are historic sites. Uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service, a uh, bunch of land, Bureau of Land Management. If you're from this part of the world, then you're probably familiar with them, but mostly in the West. Uh, United States Forest Service, out of the Department of Agriculture, a bunch of land as well. And then there are city regional parks that I think get kind of the short end of the stick. I'm not sure if they're really widely publicized. You know, I grew up in Orange County, California, and they have a great regional park system. There's another one up in the Bay Area. Um, and they do all the same thing that the rest of the federal agencies are doing. It's just a, a more localized effort for them. So a quick overview, um, U.S. Forest Service, founded in 1905. Um, the precursor to that agency was actually in the late 1800s. And at that time in our country's history, we were cutting down trees and building houses and moving westward and doing all that stuff. And Congress said, uh, stop, we've got to be smart about this. So how do we sustain that supply of wood and grasslands for this country? And through, again, some individual efforts of a guy named Gifford Pinchot, he was the first uh, director of the U.S. Forest Service. But that agency is within the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which you know, there's been some talk over the years of shifting them over to interior where the rest of the land management agencies live. But their original mission was more of an agriculture sustaining supply of wood. Their recreation 
<laughs> business is also part of their mission and that has just exploded in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, they have all kinds of issues with people living on the forest during tough economic times. They have the same variety of disciplines of professions that the park service or anybody else has. Uh, Bureau of Land Management, how do we used to call them? Burrows, somethings and mines, I don't know, it's kind of irreverent, but um, so more of a sustained yield thing. Uh, BLM has been very active in oil and gas permitting on their lands, grazing, also a heavy recreation emphasis. Uh, California Desert District, those guys, actually they're all XNPS rangers, but um, you know, heavy, heavy recreational demand on those lands out there. Um, and they also have national monuments. I think from the Clinton administration on, kind of the parting shot of a lot of presidents have been to designate national monuments. And most of those under the Clinton administration actually have been managed by the Bureau of Land Management. Um, back to the Forest Service, they also have national recreation areas. I think they have the cool ones. Like if the other ones, the National Park Service, we got Lake Mead and you know they have Shasta and the cool part of Whiskey Town and some others. But so BLM, um, again, more of a consumptive but conservation minded uh, approach to land management. And it, you know, and let me back up just a second. I grew up riding dirt bikes in the California desert. And I thank God that we had places like BLM lands to go do that. So I think there's a place for all of this. For me personally, the mission of the National Park Service resonated more closely with me. So that's who I cho chose to work for. But none of us are any better than the others. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service manage uh, wildlife refuges. There's several here in Arizona. Uh, we all go to the same law enforcement training and we're cross designated in a lot of cases. They do wildland fire. They do some really cool wildlife crime investigations. If you watch CSI on TV, they have a wildlife crime lab up in Ashland, Oregon and I can take a bullet out of a deer that was poached here, I can send it to Ashland, and they're gonna match that bullet with the ballistics of a gun. I can take a blood sample out of the back of a pickup truck, send it to Ashland, and they will match that. So they have the same technical capabilities to work wildlife crimes. They do some really cool stuff. Also, they're the lead agency in a lot of the wildlife protection laws that we have, migratory birds, endangered species, they specialize in all that. Uh, some of the differences between the agencies to work for U.S. Fish and Wildlife, you tend to have, or it's desirable to have a wildlife biology degree and more specialized training that rather than kind of the generalist that, that I was with the Park Service. But they do some really cool stuff. Uh, Bureau of Reclamation, you might not think of is a land management agency, but uh, that's Hoover Dam outside of Las Vegas, just west of here. Interesting thing, and this gets into the kind of law enforcement side of it, but the Bureau of Reclamation has the jurisdiction and responsibility of everything encircling Hoover Dam there. And then the National Park Service has everything behind it and everything downstream from it until it hits another dam. And then Bureau of Reclamation has that again, but Bureau of Reclamation formed what do you think, to control water and sustain water for agriculture and everything downstream? Highly, highly controversial water management in the West. But they do that. They also have an enforcement branch. And they're also heavily involved in energy production. So hydroelectric power at Hoover Dam, also at Glen Canyon, uh, just to the north of us. National Park Service, I'm actually in that raft, uh, along with Dr. Hammersley of the Parks and Rec Management Program. We had a river trip for 14 days down to Colorado a couple years ago, and I had worked both on North Rim and South Rim, and I thought I kind of knew the place, but uh, no. <laughs> you, you really have to get out there as a visitor to appreciate some of these places, and the Geography and the geology literally changed around every bend in that place. 
for 14 days straight. It was great. Um, so National Park Service, we have places like Grand Canyon and all the historic sites that I mentioned. Um, probably the most um, conservative or stringent protection uh, mission of, of all the agencies. And there's a place for all of that. But yeah, that's my favorite. But um, so the Park Service, like I said, we have a lot of different jobs in the agency. So I don't care what you're thinking about doing after you get out of here, but you might want to give the National Park Service some consideration or any of the other agencies. The law enforcement side of it that I did, um, by policy, we are specifically trained like any other police officer. Um, and that wasn't always the case. Um, back in the 70s, I know nobody in here was probably around back then, but the bicentennial of the United States was a big deal. You know, it was about yay tall and all that was going on. Um, so what happened during the bicentennial? We're facing another, what, the 250th anniversary of the country here before too long. But we had people come over, all sorts of dignitaries from all kinds of countries, the bicentennial, bicentennial of the revolution it was a couple of years before 76. And so there was a lot of interest in visiting the parks. And we worked very closely with US Secret Service, State Department and others in protecting those people. And they said, National Park Service, you guys are really messed up. Yeah, don't know what you're doing. And up until that point, to carry a gun as a law enforcement officer. You sign your oath of office, here's your gun, here's a ticket book, go forth and do good and don't get hurt. That was up until 1970. But if you look at the history of other police agencies, it's pretty much the same thing. There wasn't a lot of training before then. And at, at that time in 1970 and then in 76, Congress said, yeah, stop this craziness. Let's do it right. So we got the General Authorities Act. And as you look at the national park system or, or any other land management agency, you might think, well, most everybody is carrying a gun and working law enforcement. Fish and Wildlife Service is more 50-50, but for the park service out of the almost 28,000 or 30,000 employees, like 3,000 of us were armed and dangerous. So we do all the popular stuff, but we're really the smallest component of the whole agency. So again, there's a lot of work to be done by like a lot of other folks. That work's carried out by park rangers, so people in an outfit kind of like mine, and the US Park Police, and you may have seen news about them in recent times, but they are a division of the National Park Service, and they are assigned to obviously Washington DC, where you probably saw all the news coverage, uh, Gateway National Recreation Area in New York and Golden Gate National Recreation Area in California. And they are more of a policing oriented outfit just due to the volume of stuff that you can imagine goes on in the Washington Mall and those large recreation areas. I think they also have a detachment down in Atlanta for one of our sites too. But So we have a specialized police agency within the National Park Service also. So we do a lot of stuff and this is what kept me interested and challenged actually for my entire first career. And we have to be professionals at all of this stuff. And I had a, a former superintendent told me, well, what's a great score in football or what's a great percentage in baseball of times that you actually connect with the ball? Somebody's batting like 333, they're a rock star. The quarterback completes, what, 50% of their passes and they're a hero. I gotta complete 100% of my passes or I'm either hurting myself or hurting somebody else or hurting the park. So especially critical stuff that we do. Emergency medical services, there's nobody else out there to do it. And so that responsibility falls on us. And at different times, I had different levels, especially in there, but you know, I'm sticking needles in people's arms, sticking plastic down their face to make sure that they keep breathing. But we were at Death Valley. I was two hours from groceries. 
and we ran the contract ambulance service for that section of the county because nobody else was out there. So we got really good at doing some of that. Um, and we would meet a helicopter from Vegas and we had a designated landing zone where they would come in. It was a 45 minute drive for me and was a 45 minute flight for them. And then sometimes I'd, I'd get on board the helicopter and fly the rest of the way into Vegas with them. What happens in Flagstaff or Phoenix? Fire, EMS gets there, boom, three minutes, I'm at the back door of the hospital, I'm done. You really <laughs> need to be on top of your game to sustain somebody that's hurt really bad for that long. So Park Service, we provide different levels of service depending on the unit of the system. Death Valley, we were running paramedics. Independence Hall in, in uh, Pennsylvania, they have the city services that are two minutes out, so they don't have much of an EMS system. Structure on wildland fire, uh, I think we had 200 structures or something like that at Death Valley. A lot of them historic, and so the way that we fight fire in those places is different than flag fire department going in and just, I'll be irreverent, spraying and praying water all over the place, you know. Um, so there's different techniques that we have to use with that. We're a big component of the wildland fire system, and I got sent all over the country fighting wildland fire. And that's all a part of our responsibility and shared responsibility with other agencies. I probably fought more fire on Forest Service and BLM than I did within the units of the National Park System. Search and rescue, we don't exactly go call to call to call to call on search and rescue with like a few exceptions. You know, Mount Rainier and, and some of these places that, that have a, a higher risk for, for injury. Um, but we all get cross-trained in that and depending on where you're assigned, you might do that more or less. Law enforcement, obvious. Um, physical security, so protecting buildings like the one that we're in here with alarm systems, but historic structures aren't quite as tight as this place is, and so the alarms are going off all the time at night. Um, and those can be some pretty scary places, but, but protecting the integrity of those structures, both from a law enforcement and just a visitor use and, and kind of damage uh, perspective. We have museum collections and visitor centers. You may have seen artifacts displayed. The National Park Service sent me to the Smithsonian Institution for a week to look at museum security issues. Talk about cool. <laughs> My brother worked for a law enforcement agency in California and it's like, yeah, dude, uh, did you get sent to the Smithsonian, you know, to look at museum security? It's like, well, no, I just busted drunks in Santa Ana. Okay, well, yeah, lucky you. Um, so I got to do that stuff in really great places and had some really unique opportunities. Safety, you know, if, if you can't go home at night, then there's no point in doing the job. And, and we put ourselves out there. Um, we'll, we'll sacrifice a lot to save a lot. So somebody's hurt. Um, we do some crazy things. And then special operations, we have our own version of SWAT teams. Uh, post 9-11, we were deployed to places like Mount Rushmore, what they call the Icon Parks. We were deployed to places like Hoover Dam because Bureau of Reclamation didn't have the capacity. Um, special events, you know, the 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor, we're out there. So we have people that are dedicated to a higher level of law enforcement training to handle things like that. Grand Canyon has their own standalone ready to roll kind of SWAT organization um, in case of need. Uh, we had a ranger shot and killed at Rainier. Actually, she was a graduate of, of our program next door. Um, and they had to lock down visitor centers and it was like a school shooting kind of situation. So yeah, those assets are, are needed. We also do a lot of cooperative work with the military. I got to fly on a C-130 gunship, you know, protecting my park. That was kind of cool. Um, so there's a lot of different things that we do that you wouldn't think that park rangers actually get involved with. And it's not just us, it's everybody. Um, and probably some of the most fun that I had and the most rewarding times were working with other agencies. So the Flagstaff Area National Monument's just up the road from here. So 
Wapatki, Sunset Crater, Volcano, and Walnut Canyon are all managed under one headquarters, but it's, they're three distinct units of the, the system. But they have like four rangers out there in the field and they can't do it all. So they have agreements with Summit Fire, with Coconino County, with the Forest Service. We all get together on an annual basis and cuss and discuss operations and how things will work. But that was that was really a lot of fun for me working with those other agencies. You know, they they have an issue and I go out and back them up and I'd roll with DPS out on Interstate 40 and, and help them take care of business. So all of those people also really contribute to the mission of the National Park Service through agreement, search and rescue. Well, Coconino County here has the greatest set of toys I've ever seen in my life, plus the training and experience and staffing. Well, why do we do our own thing? Why don't we just work with them and have them take care of that workload? So um, that really works out well. Uh, concessioners get the short end of the stick. Zantera, just uh, their office is up here by Home Depot. You know, if you can't go to the bathroom and if you can't find some place to eat and if you can't find some place to sleep, your visit to your park is kind of screwed up and they really can't appreciate it. So concessioners provide all those services. Zantera has their own fire and safety folks and EMTs and, and all that, but they're just as much a part of the Get, getting the mission accomplished as the National Park Service is. And there's, we could talk about concessioners for a long time too. And then volunteers, we don't have the staffing that we would like and volunteers can come in and do things that we would like to get done but can't. I had a couple of old guys, I guess they would be my age now, but, um, or I'm their age now, but, they love to build stuff. And so they would come in to the park for the winter. This was out of Death Valley and added on to my ranger station and just did all kinds of stuff that was fun and really helpful to us, but we didn't have the resources to do it. We could buy the materials, but it wasn't a high enough priority for the rest of our maintenance staff to do that. And so they came in and built stuff and that was just great. Um, and, and they do just a tremendous job for us and a lot of different things. So legally, and this is another one of those things we could talk for hours about, and we get challenged on this sometimes, like, well, you're just a park ranger, and what, you know, what authority do you have, and why are you telling me what to do? So our law book is the United States Code, <clears throat> and we have our own chapter dealing with the administration of the National Park Service. There's also another chapter dealing with conservation, and another chapter dealing with criminal acts, and then there's drugs and a bunch of other things that we enforce as well. But it's, it's the same thing as Arizona state law. Um, the jurisdiction, so the authority is what I can do. The jurisdiction is where I can do it. And it was interesting working with other law enforcement officers. Wow, you're a federal officer. You can go any place. No, I can't. Keep thinking that uh, we did a lot of work with Las Vegas Metro PD. All right, come on over to Nevada. Well, uh, yeah, I will, but <laughs> my badge doesn't say I can do that. There's agreements and everything that, that covers that, but my jurisdiction or the where I could do it was limited to units within the national park system. Through agreement, yeah, I worked on BLM and forests and played around with Vegas Metro PD. And the, the statement there that it's concurrent in Arizona means that there's three different types of jurisdiction, but concurrent means that we share the jurisdiction with the local agencies. So what that looks like at Grand Canyon is the National Park Service has an agreement with the county sheriff, Jim Driscoll, who once upon a time when I worked there was a sergeant up there, interestingly. But um, so Jim and the National Park Service have an agreement and it says, okay, well, the county wants all felonies and murders and serious crimes, National Park Service, you know, you can take the simple assaults and simple thefts and the lower graded things, but if it's something serious, call us. And then it also says, hey, Park Service, come on out and play with us in Tucson or out towards the reservation because we're gonna need your help. So all of that is, is renewed about every four years or so as, as sheriffs change. 
So we share the jurisdiction and the law enforcement responsibilities. And it actually works out really well. Um, so how do you get to do this stuff? <clears throat> and I apologize, my, my slide looks different than yours, but essentially it's the same thing. So we, have, we are one of six programs in the country that offer the seasonal law enforcement training. 700 hours, we meet Monday through Friday, eight to five, half the weekends, a couple of nights here and there for a semester. And it's a police academy for those that want to work temporary jobs or seasonal jobs with the park service. Also Washington State Parks accepts our training. Um, so you get done with the classroom stuff and then you go into a field training experience, which is the ranger orientation and evaluation. So you ride with somebody for like a month to kind of prove that you know what you're doing and then you're turned loose on the world. Um, and in our system, that results in a type two commission or in some systems that would be like a reserve police officer any place else. And we have two different types of employees, temporary, so seasonal, you work summers, or that's why you work winters, and then permanent full time, that's like you're there forever if you wanna be. Um, same exact training, you go to the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in beautiful coastal Georgia. I got sent there from sunny, dry Arizona to humid Georgia in the middle of darn summertime. Um, and then enhanced facilities, kind of a refresher of the training. And at the end of that, another field training experience. You think about me, at the time I worked at Petrified Forest. Not a lot goes on out there. And so for me to really get good and get practiced, they would send to some place like Grand Canyon or Lake Mead where I had a higher volume experience, got that figured out and then went back home. And that results in a permanent commission. Functionally, there's really no difference. The permanents can independently serve warrants and make felony arrests and do investigations and everything. But, but honestly, out there in the world, we all work together. So to the public, it makes no difference. And there's also an opportunity to, to step that up a little bit. This is the former chief ranger from the Flagstaff Area National Monuments. He was a firearms instructor. So he actually taught for our program. Those are a couple of my students out there. Um, a couple of weeks, most of those advanced training courses are at least another two to about seven weeks long. Physical security, alarm systems, fire protection, with historic structures is really complicated. So there's specialized training in that. We have our own investigators. Um, the investigative services branch, if you look on Facebook, they're, they're putting out a bunch of press these days. You're laughing at me, but I know Facebook is probably just old guys now. And I don't know, but anyway, they're probably out there in other places that I don't look, but. So we have our own version of the FBI or detectives in the national park system and they are duty stationed at places of, of higher volume and strategically so we have a couple assigned to lake mead because that's an insane place you combine gasoline alcohol crazy people from california sorry californians but i can say that because i came from there and 115 degrees and you have problems so um, we have investigators at Lake Mead, a couple of Grand Canyon, uh, Tucson for the border parks, and then throughout the rest of the system. I think there's about 50 of those folks in the whole outfit. So we do that too. We work our own investigations and then a, a variety of different instructor certifications. So if you have a passion like this guy does for firearms, you know, you, you go after that. There's other specialties that, that we train. We have to go through refresher training every year to the tune of, I guess it's 40 hours. And so we need instructors and all those things. So we develop that within our system. So that's all the good stuff and the happy stuff. Um, and these aren't necessarily negative, but some of the challenges that we face as an agency and within kind of the protection law enforcement aspect of it, is people out there doing bad things on public lands uh, the marijuana grows on forests in California. 
Death Valley, we had the Hells Angels that ran a drug lab out of there for a year and a half until we found them. Um, so there's, again, I got a million and a half acres and just a few people to patrol that and a few aircraft. And how do I track that stuff down? And these guys operated for a year and a half without being detected. So, but we caught them and they did their time. So, so it just rural areas, Death Valley, we had, and not to make it sound just terrible because I love the place. Um, evidence of Asian gangs from LA going out there and practicing with their weapons because nobody would mess with them out there. So just a lot of just open space and they can go out and do stuff and really not get caught or detected. The residential population, a bigger problem for forest service and their lands, but people are, and by law, you can stay in one place, camp for 30 days per calendar year on the forest. And so people are just, they got no place else to go. And so they'll set up camp and do a lot of damage to the resource. What are they doing for toilets? You know, just that and the impact and chopping wood and whatever else they do living out there. And then they move someplace else. Well, the guys on the Coconino developed a system. So Coconino and National Forest surrounds us. They develop a system where they have a little GPS contraption or a cell phone. They open up their app, which I don't know, I can make phone calls on this thing, but that's about it. And they punch it in and they punch in the license plate and names and everything else. And they go away. And then I'm working down in Sedona, same forest. Oh, well, let me punch this in and voila, we find out that they're in violation. So that's a real challenge to stay on top of and that GPS, GIS expertise really helped them put that app together to be effective in trying to combat that. Visitors, I love them. Um, sometimes just poorly informed and, and it's our job to educate them, but um, not a bad thing. It's just an influence in, the, in our workload for sure. The authority and jurisdiction can be complicated. And with things like the shared jurisdiction that I talked about, we had a murder in a park that I worked at. And I was like, okay, well, we're not totally set up to deal with that. And the jurisdiction is shared. And so as a federal land, we call the FBI. Yeah, we do bad checks and we do, you know, property crime. We don't know anything about murder uh, by, so we worked that in, in conjunction with the, the local county and, and made that work. There's a misconception again as to what we can do and where we can do that. Um, you know, good thing, but it, it's, it, it limits us in some ways. The resource theft, the whole reason Petrified Forest was established was because people were stealing the resource. We've had units of the system deauthorized because all of the resources were stolen. Fossil Cycad National Monument, Midwest someplace, I forget where it was. Uh, Dakotas maybe. Part of it was researchers <laughs> and, and the public and these were cool things and fossils and so they just removed it all and then by the time it worked its way through Congress, this was in the 30s I think, um, it's like yeah there's nothing left or Perceptions change, Mackinac Island in Michigan, if anybody's been up that way, that was a unit of the national park system. And then it was turned back over to the, the state, I believe. Um, I heard Mar-a-Lago had been donated to the national park system through the, from the Post family, I think it was, like Post cereals. And then it was later sold off and we know who's living there right now, but, um, so things change over time, but um, yeah, the resource theft is a real thing that's going on out there and there's a commercial value for these things. In uh, class yesterday, I was talking about reptile poaching. Like who's, who'd steal, you know, lizards and stuff? There was a commercial demand for those things. And we were, I was at Carlsbad Caverns way in Southeast New Mexico and a buddy of mine was a Joshua tree in California we both had the same bad guys stealing our critters. So we were working that together and we had this whole intel sheet put together to try to track those guys down. But there's an international demand for some of this stuff. Ginseng out of um, Shenandoah, hallucinogenic mushrooms out of redwoods. 
I had to explain that to a judge in Arizona once. That was kind of funny, but you hadn't heard of that stuff. But you know, so there's there's those things that are in demand, bear gallbladders. I mean, there's international demand for some of this stuff, and so it's up to us to try to figure out what that market is, what's being traded and sold. Um, cultural artifacts from the Southwest, the big, big market in that for many years that's kind of dropped off recently. It's just not as much fun or profitable for those knuckleheads to do that anymore. Um, so our, our resources are right out there. Uh, another picture of Hubble Trading Post, uh, same kind of rug, that's a fake, but all those pictures on the wall are irreplaceable. And so from a fire protection standpoint, I can't just have a sprinkler go off and blast the heck out of those things with a bunch of water. I have to have different agents. Uh, securing that building, we may have, and we do have people living there to aid in the security, but who keeps track of that stuff in the middle of the night when they're closed? And that is drafty doors and you can't really lock stuff that, that easily. So. And that's part of the historic structure challenge. Um, Yosemite, a real story. They had a, a, a basket and the fire detection system or fire suppression system went off when it shouldn't have and it shot down agent and blew that thing apart. So I was like, okay, how do we do that differently? Um, and then a lot of historic structures we use for office space. Scotty's Castle at Death Valley. Anybody ever hear of that place? Anyway, eccentric millionaire built this place and he had this old character, Death Valley Scotty. He was just kind of an old crusty dude that, I don't know, Mr. Johnson liked him, I guess. And so he lived there as kind of a caretaker and then he became a story unto himself. Well, we had certain portions of that, this big massive structure that were offices. And we had computers and guess what? One night the computer catches on fire and burned down this, this structure. So, um, and, and it took them probably 25 years to get the funding and support to rebuild that thing. But the original structure was gone forever. So how do you take care of all that stuff? It's not quite as easy as in the rest of the world. I call this environmental challenges, but it's the environment that we kind of live in. And growing up in Southern California in the middle of just too many people, I loved the opportunity to live someplace like 20 miles outside of Holbrook, Arizona. But, you know, you live with the same people, you eat with the same people, you die with the same people, you marry them and then you divorce them. You know, and it's just this incestuous kind of relationship sometimes. But if you have interpersonal difficulties at work, then you have interpersonal difficulties at home. And there's limited opportunities to associate with other folks if you're that far removed. Um, Death Valley, I was two hours from groceries. So, yeah, it's <laughs> the bleed over can either be really great or really bad. but. Um, frankly, most of my experience was especially positive and I've remained friends with these folks for years and years. Armed encounters, we deal with that. There was this perverse pride among some of my peers that we were the most assaulted branch of government in the entire you know, federal government. Well, that's stupid. Um, why is that happening? But the difference is you're the lone ranger out there and you might have to wait 30 minutes for someone to come help you out. My brother working in Santa Ana, California. Oh yeah, you know, I got six units, you know, showing up at his doorstep in three minutes. Yosemite, same thing, but petrified forest, not so much. Um, so those, those can be challenging. The, the stress of the isolation and kind of the limited community can be challenging. I got to Carlsbad, New Mexico, 25,000 people, and I thought I was in the middle of downtown. I got to associate with a church again. I got to do Boy Scout stuff. I got to do all this stuff again and be a part of a community. And that was 10 years out of my 27 that I worked for the Park Service. So uh, jurisdiction, land ownership, 
we have a lot of private adjacent landowners that don't always care for the federal government and building relationships with them can be challenging and one of the guys an old rancher said mark you know i kind of like you but i don't trust the park service to replace you with somebody like you was their perspective and it was like i've been on this land for you know 50 or 60 years and you guys come in here and you know, cycle through every three to five years because we tend to have to move to promote and it's like well yeah you and i can get along together today but you know who's going to be here tomorrow and and that also carried over to county um, managers and relationships and boards of supervisors you know they've been here their entire lives a lot of them and we don't have we're not perceived to have that vested interest in that location so those things can kind of be challenging uh, county sheriff if they don't like what the park service is doing then that really impacts those cooperative agreements that i was talking about earlier and then the constitutional law issues the Fourth Amendment protection against search and seizure. Well, if you're in a motor home, is that considered to be your home and your house? Or is there a vehicle exception that allows me to go in and search that? I mean, all within probable cause and there's a bunch of other legal constraints. But how does the court view a tent? <laughs> you know, as far as the Fourth Amendment goes and what we can do. And so we have, we're fortunate we have a U.S. attorney here in Flagstaff that is very well versed in that. But, you know, for somebody working Phoenix PD, oh, a house is a house, okay? So there are certain search warrant requirements and this is how it goes down. Well, for us, we got all that and then some. So the legal side of it could be challenging. Um, so current issues, and this is what I think Dr. Barnes actually wanted me to kind of focus on a little bit. Um, COVID has really been interesting. <laughs> So about a year ago when all this was starting to crank up, visitation was way down from an employee perspective, and I've seen it here at NAU too, I don't feel comfortable going to work. So I'm gonna stay home, I'm gonna work in the house. Well, it's hard to protect the National Park Unit from your house. I mean, there's certain administrative things that you can do, but there's a limitation to that. And then having everyone comfortable with the mitigation, the risk mitigation, and then there's the uncertainty about COVID. And it's like, well, it can be transmitted aerially in outhouses. It's like, well, you know how many outhouses we have in the national park system, like a bunch. And so I mean, it's just a lot of uncertainty and, and lack of science on how this stuff is transmitted and how it works. And then with the initial kind of stay at home response, visitation was way down, which was okay because we had facilities closed. And and then as the summer approached, it's like, I, and I was feeling it, maybe you guys did too, I have got to get out of here. <laughs> and so the parks were really slammed in the summer, but then there were still restrictions in place in the parks as far as how many people can be in a building and we're operating visitor centers from the front porch we're not letting people in just a lot of different operational issues they got us through the summer but then there will pot kids like uh well it's starting to get cold outside how do we do this and so they got a bunch of propane heaters and set those up so some operational changes there but yeah the whole thing was just it was, it was complicated but now we're really getting slammed with folks that just need to get out and Frankly, that's why those places are there. Post 9-11, I was the chief ranger at Carlsbad Caverns and probably one of the proudest times in my career, you know, all of government locked down. You guys probably don't even quite remember that, but the air was quiet. There were no airplanes in the air. All government offices were closed because we just didn't know what we were facing. And I had a, the chief rangers i was number two to the superintendent and what are we going to do and i said boss we're going to open our park we're going to open this place and people were thankful because they had a place of refuge they could get away from all the external stuff that's going on and reflect and regroup and be productive and 
And the boss said, oh, you know, what about this and that? I said, boss, they're not flying an airplane into my cave. Get over it, you know? And there was an oil refinery 25 miles north of us. They're going to take that out. It produces a quarter of the jet fuel in this country. They're going to fly an airplane into that. We're going to open our darn park. And I was really adamant about that. Um, but that's what these places are all about. And that's the importance of them. Um, I had the opportunity to be with the Secretary of Interior, so my big, big boss, and she came through the, the park, and long story short, we had a special tour of the cave for her, and, and I got to be on that. And she said, you know, this is the first time in three years I haven't been tied to a cell phone, and I could actually get away. Otherwise, you know, in your home, phone rings and everything else, and she couldn't get there from here because she was 700 feet underground. <laughs> And that's the importance of some of these places. Um, so back to these things a little bit. The increased visitor use that we've experienced. Centennial, the National Park Service, was in 2016. A lot of publicity leading up to that. The highest levels of visitation that we've experienced since the bicentennial of the country in 76. It peaked, and then it dropped down, and then was a centennial celebration picked back up again. So we're still riding off of that popularity. And then in, in challenging economic times and COVID, you're not going to Disneyland, you're going to Grand Canyon. Or you're not going to Dolly World, you're going to Great Smokies. So poor economic times tend to support more visitation to units of the system and, and natural areas because it's a great deal for your money for one thing. So those are all kinds of issues that we're dealing with, with visitor use. Um, the executive branch variables, I'll just be polite and say that the, the budget has been challenged and the land protection perspective has been different um, in the last four years, uh, probably more so than any time that I've experienced in my career. And, and I think that's, that's shifting. We had areas that were um, reduced in size national monuments um, under the authority of the Antiquities Act that create national monuments the perspective was well if I can create them I can take them away too and that never quite made it through the court system before that um, individual left office and then the last one that's kind of cut off right there is employee retention and in working with our National Training Center one of them that's located in Grand Canyon we can get people in Dora, we just can't keep them. And yeah, it looks really sexy and great and worthy mission and all that, but how do we sustain our employees? And part of that I think is just a, a cultural shift. My kids have held more jobs than I had and I'm like 40 years older than they are. So that, that's just part of people don't stay the same place as long as they used to, but we have the greatest mission in the world. Why can't we keep people dedicated to that? Well, it's some of the issues like isolation and just working for the federal government and everything else that maybe people have a challenge with. But um, so we're, we're working on that a lot of different ways. But what is more important to this country than protecting our heritage? Why do we have military resources fighting all over the world to save stuff like this, to protect who we are as a country? And I've had senior military officers tell me, it's like, yeah, Mark, well, one, you probably saw more armed encounters than some of my soldiers, and which was true at the time. And by the way, we're overseas fighting for stuff like this. And we're overseas fighting for our heritage. I got to do it on the front lines in those places. And it is just that important. Because with the, okay, get rid of Yellowstone, get rid of Grand Canyon, get rid of Hubble Trading Post, get rid of all those 400 units, get rid of our public lands and what do we have? A bunch of cities like every other country on the planet. That is what identifies us. This stuff here is what identifies us. And that's what kept me going for 27 years and still 10 years, 15 years later. 
and it you know when you the tough times when you get called out for the third time in one night because somebody's doing something dumb it's like uh yeah i'm i'm taking care of business here i'm taking care of our heritage and that is there's nothing more important than that and the folks that i work with were absolutely dedicated to that and we went through tough times but i love them all and I work with the best people in the country doing the most important thing that we can do in our country. Um, so that's kind of what it's all about. That's actually a statue at uh, Grand Teton National Park. But it's, it's, it's building support for the park system one person at a time. And it's, you know, that's where it, it, it's all at right there. It's not the high dollar search and rescue stuff. It's it's taking that individual effort, and that's what got me into it. Some dumb ranger back in the early 70s spent five minutes out of his entire career with my family, and I said, that is who I'm going to be. And that's how the whole system came around. So we got like four, seven minutes or so for questions. The chat has seemed to be pretty quiet or else I was just ignoring it. But um, I would love to talk about any of the agencies, what I did, what I didn't do, how to get there from here. What else did you want me to touch on? Um, I mean, I think opening it up for questions is great. Um, so we'll take a second to call the questions. Okay. But I'm sure they have them because what you said was so interesting. But I can start with a question. What's the biggest change that you've seen in the Park Service in, that, in your time that you've been in it? Okay, Dr. Barnes asked about the biggest change that I've seen in my time. The positive part of that has been the professionalization of what we do. And so we went literally from me riding in the back of a station wagon with a patient to the hospital in Kanab, Utah, to running full-blown paramedic programs my son was a full-time paramedic at Lake Mead this last summer. So stepping up our game, professionalizing all of those emergency services, but, but the entire profession, the science that, God, look at resource management. We went from some cowboy working out at petrified forest to professional doctoral level um, paleontologists. So the professionalization overall, I think has really been a benefit, the downside to that has been the professionalization and specialization. It's like, oh, well, all I do is law enforcement or all I do is, you know, paleo. And, and the generalist concept has been lost. And I think that was really valuable to the visitor and to the, the system. So yeah, I'll go both ways on that. Um, how do I get involved in, in internships at the parks? Uh, so Gabriel, a um, couple of things. Uh, there's a web page called usajobs.gov. That's where all of the vacancy announcements are posted. Most all parks that I'm aware of have internships now. I know the Flagstaff Area National Monuments. We get along with well, all those people out there, but, but we have a very close working relationship with them. Um, and there are internships in all of the different disciplines. So they've hosted people out of the business college working in their admin division. Um, feel free to reach out to me or um, get a hold of me through Dr. Barnes and we can, we can go direct on that. Um, the most out there degree. So I don't know if you're asking at the weirdest degree or the most popular degree. Um, you know, I come from a police science, criminal justice background, but I don't care what whatever degree program you're in, if it will get you across that stage and graduate, if that's the perfect degree to go into the National Park Service with. The fact that you have a degree is, is super important. The specific discipline really is not. My favorite park, um, yeah, all of them. Um, you know, but I, I lived at Desert View at Grand Canyon for two years, and every single day of my life I got to see that place. The people that work South Rim Village might not even see the rim, but I got to see it every single day. So the canyon, the Petrified Forest is a close second just because of the resource and the people. The weirdest degree, um, 
But uh, I, I don't know. Um, I wish I could answer that one. But I would just say that whatever the degree program is, we have a, a place for that. Um, a random cool fact about petrified forest. I could think of an irreverent one. Um, so a, a random cool fact would be that every single known time period of human occupation occurred out there. There are records of every single human type person that was out there. It goes back like 12,000 years, at least there. Um, that's kind of a cool thing. Um, it is the only unit of the national park system that protects a section of Route 66. And that is still maintained there. You can go out there and you can see an old Studebaker along the road there, just north of I-40. And with the centennial of Route 66 coming up, um, that's taken on a little more interest out there. Um, so what else do you all have out there? Was it, they just passed the, the Great Outdoors Act. Oh, yeah. Was that, is that good? Is that bad? What are you all thinking? Like, how do you read that uh, legislation? I mean, it sounds like well, it was, parks were underfunded for so long, right? So is it really going to help things? Or what do you think? So the, um, the Great American Outdoors Act, I think is the name of it. One of the, something like that. Um, the underfunding issue with the National Park Service has been around since 1916, probably. Um, and for whatever unfortunate reason, and I could probably explain why, we allowed a backlog of maintenance to occur, like to the tune of billions of dollars. Part of me says that's poor management. The other part of me says, yeah, we just didn't have the money to do what we wanted to do. But the Great American Outdoors Act is permanent legislation that and the National Park Service will receive, I think, 50% of the funding out of that to take care of that backlog to get our facilities, roads, bridges back to where they need to be. Um, probably not a lot in the way of funding, but in project funding, so the rest of the economy will really benefit from that. But it's permanent legislation that will take care of us for a long time and hopefully address the backlog and prevent a future backlog. Yeah, I, everybody's really pumped about that. That was one of the few bright lights in the last four years as far as the national park system went. And I'm not being political, I'm just being objective. Um, search and rescue, what's the procedure for that? So a lot of that training occurs at the local park level because there are specialized things that you know, Grand Canyon operations are different than Mount Rainier. There are some similarities. The National Association of Search and Rescue has uh, online training programs that you can take. But usually the search and rescue training is at the park level. But if you have an interest in technical ropes and, and, and rock climbing and those kinds of things, that is supportive. Also, if you have an interest in that, there's probably a local agency like here in Coconino County, get a hold of the sheriff's office and get hooked up with them. Um, and, and a lot of those, the search and rescue and structural fire and diving and others that I didn't mention, if you express an interest and take some personal effort to develop those skills, we'll support that on down the road. So, and again, feel free to reach out to me personally through uh, Dr. Barnes and we can talk about any of that stuff in greater detail later. I'm showing two minutes. Bail me out, guys. <laughs> Are y'all hungry and need lunch? <laughs> we're a lot of fun, you know. Uh, I think we're uh, kind of underrated sometimes, but yeah, you know, and, and, you know, in all seriousness, some of that comes from the, the professionalization that I was talking about. It's like, well, I only do law enforcement. It's like, well, no. Look at the mission statement. We do a lot more than that, but... Uh, yeah, we, we're, we're, we're okay people, you know. <laughs> well, we can call it fair. And okay, let's call it fair. Let's give Mark a hand. Well, thanks. Happy to be here. Hope to come back. Thank you. I so appreciate it.
And so if anybody's got any questions or concerns about anything class-wise, I'm happy to talk with you. And like Mark said, I can connect you up with him and his contact information if you're interested. Um, we've got one of the best park ranger training programs in the country here, and Mark needs that. So you know, if it's something that you're interested in, think about it. Um, but otherwise, be well. Have a good rest of your day. And see y'all on Thursday. Um, I have a question. I turned in my citizenship assignment. And I did like the link, 